Now, this question is from Jay Willis. Says, should an investor attempt to factor in the effects of quantitative easing into their investment plan, or is it more likely to be a short-term event unworthy of consideration? Well, the answer to the first part of the question is clearly yes, but I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> I mean, there, you, there's a point at which you have to accept the flaws and foibles of the market for what they are. And uh, this very low yield, even negative yields somewhere around the world are there. And you may not like it, but that's the marketplace. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what you would do if you take quantitative easing into account, honestly. And I would also say that it can't go on forever. Uh, and uh, interest rates can't stay this low, I don't think, forever. Although I would have said it had gone on long before this, um, gone back up long before this. And uh, I don't you know, there's some questions that even the, quote, great Bogle doesn't know the answer to. Uh, and uh, so I look at this with the same kind of mystery you do, but I don't know what to do about it. So I just, you know, I'm roughly 50-50, bonds and stocks, mostly index funds, and munis in my, in my uh, personal account, and uh, corporates and, and taxables, treasuries, bond market, in my, I will always use the intermediate term bond market fund, not the total bond market fund. And uh, that gives you a little advantage in yield. And I just do it, and I don't pay a lot of attention to it. I mean, I, I don't think I look at my portfolio. I know I don't do it once a year. I mean, I know what's roughly what's in there. I don't even know any more than that. I think sometimes we complicate simple things. I mean, the idea of rebalancing, for example, is okay if you know what you're doing and knowing you're sacrificing all the time. Your higher yielding asset, uh, but you're reducing the volatility as markets go up. That's good in the one hand and bad in the other. Uh, but to do it too frequently, to do it every time as a one point change in the ratio, it's just silly. It doesn't matter. So it's simplify, simplify, simplify. I think that's a quote from Thoreau. What do you think about the theory, though, that the, uh, because of the uh, low interest rate environment, that a lot of people are going out in the risk uh, uh, and investing in the market in equities instead to try to get a return, and that when uh, the easing uh, eases, that uh, a lot of those people will be bailing and going to higher yielding things. Do you think that's uh, a correct analysis or not? First of all, at the margin, and you know, we, we, it's hard to even express these things. Uh, you know, would I recommend a wholesale shift that way? That'd be insane. Would I recommend maybe a marginal change to, to capitalize on your feelings? I'm not much of a believer in that, but I don't see any reason you couldn't do 5% in, in high-yielding stocks, um, higher-yielding stocks, or the, um, high, what do we call, high, high dividend yield fund. I thought that was a good idea. That didn't happen to be mine, but I thought it was a good idea. And, uh, and the same thing with bonds. Um, you know, if, when they, when the when interest rates go up, bonds are going to go down, but stocks are going to go down too because the interest rate, pre, the premium, equity premium, uh, will have to shrink. I mean, it's, it's, if it stays the same, bonds will move hand in hand. Stocks will move head, hand in hand with bonds. Just if, if that number is going to stay stable, it doesn't stay totally stable, and sometimes it's very counterintuitive. But that's kind of the right way to look at it. So there really isn't a good haven, and my own view is that reaching for yield is a very risky thing to do. Uh, it looks fine, you get the income, and then all of a sudden it stops. And you've gone too far out in the limb, to use the metaphor, and the limb snaps off. So would I say you should never use high-yielding bonds? 5% of your bond position, maybe even 10%. Won't kill you, but it won't change your, your monthly check very much. But as compared to shifting entirely, into, into high-yielding bonds, which I don't think is a good idea. I mean, I'm a diversification guy. And I'm all a believer in the, finally, the investor has to accept the rate of return that's available in the marketplace. Doing otherwise means you're accepting greater risk. And I'm just conservative, uh, simple, and it's worked for me for the better part of 65 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, could it could it have worked better? By the way, yes, I should have had 100 percent in in uh, equities these last ever since 2009, and uh, 
but I didn't. I didn't go down. I got a little nervous when the market went down 50%. Anybody does. But uh, so there is, as, as Gus mentioned, actually your, your own investor tolerance for these things. But stay in the mainstream or using the analogy I use in Little Book of Common Sense Investing, have a funny money account, 5% of the total, and play games over there. Do whatever you want, anything you want. Buy new issues, buy real estate, whatever you want to do. And with 95% in your serious money account, that's what you're going to send your kids to college on. That's what you're going to retire on. Uh, that's what you're going to have a, a long life with. Uh, that's going to be the basis of any sound investment program. All this implies, by the way, that normalcy, as we know it, kind of continues. This is a risky world we're in, a very risky world. Uh, we've talked about the risk of Russia, the risk of China, the risk of nuclear war, the risk of some idiot in North Korea, even Obama across the Pacific Ocean, uh, and uh, a certain candidate who says, we'll just take them out, which is probably not the worst idea ever. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe one of his only good ideas, by the way. <laughs> oh, I don't want to get into politics. I've had enough of that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and, you know, disease comes along. Global warming is there. Uh, economic weakness around the world. Over-leveraged world. This is a risky time. And the, the stock market seems to ignore it. Uh, can it continue to do that? Well, like everything else, that all depends. All depends how it comes out. But we're very much out of balance here in the U.S. and all over the world is even worse in terms of the amount of borrowing, the amount of that Federal, ba Federal Reserve balance sheet. Never been looked like this before the last five years. And uh, I'm not so sure what to make of all these things and which of these risks come home to roost. But anyone investing today just has to be aware of the big risks out there. Uh, in my Common Sense on Mutual Funds book, the first sentence says something like, investing is an act of faith. And truer words were never said. An act of faith that our nation will prosper. An act of faith that our corporations will continue to earn money and have it grow and pay dividends. An act of faith that our investment intermediaries will give you your fair share of the market returns that are developed from that. Uh, and this is all faith. There are no facts here. Uh, it's based on the past, but the past is, as I said the other morning, talking about a completely different subject, the past is rarely prologue. So we live in an uncertain world, and anyone that doesn't understand that should do, I don't know what, but not not save. <laughs> because as I said before, the one way to be sure you end up with nothing is to save nothing. And uh, that's the only certain proposition that I can think of at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure that's a very good answer, but... I think we should all be aware of, of just the systematic uh, risks, the broad risks that lie out there, uh, let alone the risks that lie here in the U.S., which you're all well aware, well aware of.